Welcome everyone. As as you are getting seated, uh, I was uh, Tao and I were just discussing the fact that here in 2023 there is no more Michigan time, and we begin promptly on the hour. So I'll begin with introductions now. I'm Joan Nassauer, and I'm professor of landscape architecture here in the School for Environment and Sustainability, and it is my great great pleasure to be able to introduce our 2023 Clarence Roy Smith Group lecturer, Tao Zhang. Uh, it's so fitting that Tao is the Clarence Roy lecturer. Clarence Roy uh, earned his landscape architecture degree here at the University of Michigan. He then went on to uh, found the firm Johnson, Johnson, and Roy, along with his colleagues, Carl Johnson and Bill Johnson. Bill subsequently became dean of the then School for Environment, School for Natural Resources. Um, so that kind of interdisciplinary perspective and uh, commitment to using science as a basis for design is kind of built into the DNA of the uh, of JJR, now Smith Group, and I'm really delighted that we have colleagues from Smith Group here today. Uh, so I think, I think that Clarence Roy and Bill Johnson, uh, who I've gotten to know well since being here at Michigan, would be really pleased that Tao Zhang is our Clarence Roy lecturer. To Tao's work really epitomizes ecological design Tao is a partner in the Sazaki Integrated Design Practice where he is chair of design culture. He serves on Sazaki's board of directors and the board of trustees of the firm's nonprofit Sazaki Foundation. He is very much a leader of the strong global practice of Sazaki and his works have been recognized by more than 45 awards, uh, including awards by ASLA, ASLA uh, the International Federation of Landscape Architecture, and the American Planning Association. He earned his MLA here at Michigan in 08 uh, and uh, very much partook of this integrated uh, interdisciplinary culture of the school. He came to Michigan with graduate education as an ecologist before coming to Michigan. In his work, and I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to collaborate with Tao uh, after he graduated, and we've you know, done some talking and thinking together, and his work really uh, is such a wonderful example of being highly creative while using and generating scientific evidence, and I, I hope he'll talk about that today. Some of his ongoing and recent projects include the current University of Michigan Campus Plan, 2050 Campus Plan, the University of British Columbia Campus Plan, the Giant Panda Reserve in China, the Wuhan Yangtze Riverfront, and the Shanghai Suzhou Creek Urban Design. Uh, Tao oversees Sasaki's research initiatives. In practice, Sasaki is known for being a leader in using research in design. And uh, he, his work is really going to help all of us get an even deeper understanding of ecological design. So I couldn't be more pleased than to welcome Tao Zhang. Thank you, Joan. Um, first, I have to say uh, it's such an honor, and I'm humbled to be able to stand here at the podium uh, presenting to you. Because you know, I told Joan whenever I step on UFM campus, automatically psychologically, I feel like I'm a student again. I don't deserve to be here. I should sit there, and I would rather be there right now. Uh, and I, it's such a pity that we don't have Michigan time anymore. In Boston, I always use that as an excuse to be late to a meeting, I said, oh, sorry, I'm still using Michigan time. So um, anyway, uh, I'll start uh, my presentation um, uh, with some more fun anecdotes um, before we talk about evidence-informed design and the design-integrated designs. And uh, because uh, now it's 15 years later, 
um, everything I remember about U of M or about my education here, actually it's the fun that came up first, and then people, and then classes, projects, side visits, and then uh, all the hard work uh, came after. So I want to start that way and share with you uh, what's dear and near to my heart. Um, so I went through my archives of old photo, photos and videos, and then uh, I cannot not share this with you all. <laughs> so that's nerdy. <laughs> Find Oliver. Recognize him? Who was teaching at the UFM now? Brothers, brothers and sisters, we must go with reckless love for each other. We cannot fear love's flames. We must plunge headlong to be set free. That's, that's how we spend the time uh, um, at back then called SNRE. You know, we had long hours in the studio. We had you know, um, so much love you know, for each other. And uh, I want to say, say hi. I want to you know, dedicate this presentation or this opportunity to present to my classmates uh, of 2008. Some of them might be online, so uh, that part makes me really nervous. <laughs> and Oliver sitting here as well. Um, <clears throat> Sasaki, so I was fortunate enough to graduate and then had the opportunity to start my career at Sasaki, a uh, interdisciplinary practice uh, based in Boston. And we also have offices in New York, uh, in Denver, and in Shanghai, uh, which I um, oversee uh, remotely from Boston. So before COVID, I used to travel all the time and it started to pick up again this year. So I've been traveling a lot uh, around the world. So uh, forgive me if I lost part of my English vocabulary. So I might need help, uh, so please. Don't, don't judge uh, me on losing words. And the blue dots uh, represent all the practice or projects that we've done around the world. And each year, by the end of the year, we have in-office meeting, office meeting just to reflect on our practice, you know, lessons learned, uh, opportunities that we uh, identified. And last year, I think we had over 200 projects covering five continents around the world. And I'll cover some of those in my presentation. Uh, Evidence-informed design. So I, uh, frankly, I really struggled to come up with a topic to present to you because uh, you're the ha hardest audience to, to please in my mind. Um, um, there are so, so many different ways to look at our practice or to look at how I grew uh, uh, from SNRE to the seas and then into the professional world and then travel around the world to practice. Um, I think looking back, um, my background or my life, um, my formative years at SNRE at UFM uh, really um, formed the way I practice or how I approach design. Because um, I think evidence, you call it evidence or research or um, science, informed design is really, really important to me. Because to me, science and uh, creative pursuits are not uh, um, po uh, polar opposites. To me, they're complementary. And uh, to me, science can be inspiration. And I feel more confident to defend my design when it comes from a discovery, comes from a evidence, comes from um, um, like proof the knowledge instead of ego, instead of assumptions, instead of you know uh, uh, cultural uh, norms. And then I'll um, briefly talk about some of the examples uh, to um, to demonstrate what what I meant by evidence uh, informed design. So first, I'll uh, Talk about Sasaki Strategies. It's a special group uh, at, in our office. And then uh, Sasaki Internal Research and how we um, 
devote our time and resources in the office to uh, conduct research. Of course, not at the caliper at you know uh, C's or uh, NSF, but we have our own ambition uh, and uh, commitment too. And then I'll talk about the giant panda and a ongoing project that I'm leading right now is a uh, new university campus uh, under construction. Uh, so evidence informed the design really weaves data and technology um, into design to ask better questions and reveal deeper insights from otherwise siloed uh, data. Uh, in my entire career, I've never had any project that I felt that I had the uh, complete knowledge to make design decisions. So that never happens. And Lisa was asking me, are you ready for a presentation? I said, no, it doesn't exist in design. You always feel there's something better you can do. Uh, um, so design as well. So there's, a, there's no complete information, but how to find the best way, best uh, insights from the information available uh, to make uh, the best design um, decision is important to me. How do we do that at Sasaki? Uh, right now I'm doing, um, um, I'm part of the teams on multiple uh, university campus master plan, including Michigan. Uh, because it's ongoing, and right now there's an open house on North Campus, so I'm not going to talk about that today. But I'm going to uh, explain some of the logics or tools or ways we conduct uh, campus planning to help us uh, understand the needs and connect the dots better. Uh, because campuses are extremely com uh, complex and com complicated with the conflicting demands and uh, uh, um, demands for resources all the time. Ecology, pedestrian connections, uh, different departments, you know, the most common feedback we hear here is uh, now we're, we're running out of space. So how, how to respond to that? I mean, um, you talk to many, many deans, talk to faculty members, talk to graduate students, they all have their own struggles and their needs. Every single ask is a legit and we listen, um, but how to respond? How to come with informed uh, re uh, response? So this is an example of we do co collaboration survey. At a research university, collaboration is the key. Interconnection connection is the key. But how does it translate into a spatial uh, space that can foster and f facilitate that uh, collaboration? So we, do a, uh, we, con we conducted a sur uh, web survey to ask faculty and staff to tell us which departments they collaborate with and near whom they would like to be located. And that's thousands of data. So each dot represents a uh, researcher um, or research team, and each line indicates the, um, the strength of the collaboration or desire to collaborate. So this is abstract. This is not a spatial pattern. But the next screen is interesting. So when you uh, visualize the data as dots colored by departments or other affiliations, so lines so show you know, how important those collaborations are. You know, that's you know, complicated. Health science or bio biologists need to collaborate with all uh, type of research teams. And then if you specialize that one, that's where you see the problems. You see, this is not abstract. This is in a, uh, through, on the campus. And then the longer distance means um, the collaboration is, uh, there's a gap. So they collaborate, they need to communicate every day, but they're uh, located on a polar opposite side of the campus. And then you look at the mobility, you look at the transportation. Does that support that? If it's not, then that's where you start to tackle the problem. So this is, you see, there's a one department in yellow, I forgot which one it is, but they're collaborating with the rest of the campus so much, but they're, uh, they're far away. So I think that's health science. So this is just one example. And the data and the tools are de developed by our own team called Sasaki Strategies. It's a special team of, um, uh, programmers, you know, computer scientists, or architects, planners, but they devoted their time and their career into uh, technology, data science, uh, and we, we tailor custom, um, customized tools for each project, for each challenge. So that was for um, uh, Emory College. And we are currently doing this for, for Michigan as well. So it really depends on each project, what, ne what the needs are, that team of um, um, strategies in in-house in will help us to design and customize the tools to help inform better better design. Otherwise, uh, just you know, uh, empirical way of observ observ observing how campus behaves uh, is just not sufficient anymore today. 
And this is an example of a mobility planning for uh, Rutgers University. And they, uh, they're even more um, scattered apart with the four campuses. So I know part of the challenge for Michigan is the North Campus and Central Campus are, you know, are divided. So, um, so we develop a swarm tool. Then we simply take the uh, uh, register data and we follow students. You know, this is a time sequence and when, which class, which, uh, which year, where the community, what class they take. So this visualization really helps you where the problems are and when the problems occur. And then you look at your shadow uh, schedule and if that uh, works. And then we, we come up, inform the recommendation, you know, including maybe you move faculty members instead of you know, asking all students to, uh, to commute. Uh, and then create a um, uh, trans, um, transit hub for each sub-campus. And within, um, within five minutes, of each hub can cover most of the campus areas. So, so those are just examples of using tools uh, and data to inform better design. And it's not a rocket science. The data is there, or we can con conduct survey to collect data. But that, at least that's the right approach, we believe. Uh, so when we uh, come up with recommendations, it's informed uh, as a defendable. Um, so Sasaki is such a... Um, interdisciplinary um, practice. You know, we cover from landscape architecture, ecology, civil engineering, urban design, planning, uh, architecture interiors, and, um, um, and graphic design. So we often deal with extreme urban context. So this, an, an, this is another example of in extreme urban context, what, what are the factors or parameters that we, we look at to inform our design? And so this is uh, Boston. So in downtown Boston, that not only open space you know, uh, or in Manhattan, open space is limited. And even sky is limited. So sometimes in the urban environment, the sky is the only you know, small piece of nature that you can see. So this is a really a quick tool to quantify in the urban area, um, in urban design, the quality of the, um, the view to, to the sky. So you're walking on the street and you look up and then you can quantify the area or the proportion of the sky you can see. And then this is continuous tool so that you can walk on the street. So this is near our office in Boston. So you can constantly real time to evaluate um, you know, the human experience. Um, so instead of uh, like vague description or experience. So it, this really helps uh, quantify. And then you look at the a site, look at the building. How does that impact on the view quality to the sky? So this is another tool, it's called a Dashi. Uh, really helps us look at large, complex campus planning uh, from idea to implementation, and through, especially through phasing, uh, integrate, uh, integrating funding, um, uh, phasing, and development uh, programs. And you can um, look at it almost at real time and how the campus evolves, develops, uh, have a, a, met, uh, a metric output. So in terms of funding, requirement, maintenance, phasing, and on the right, uh, top right window, if uh, you can reevaluate your, your plan and then move certain building uh, across different phases and see how that impact. Maybe one of your department doesn't need that much space anymore. What the other uh, school needs more urgent space accommodation. Then you can really real time adjust your long term plan to provide incremental uh, roadmap to implement a grand vision. So grand vision in 2050 cannot be um, be done overnight. And so how to implement that is really critical. So that's another example. And, and there are a lot of uh, nuanced information, including funding. Uh, cost, material, um, so it's really the integrated uh, real-time communication and managing tool. And I mentioned Sasaki research, so we're a bunch of nerds, so 300 plus people, and at least that's how I was drawn when I uh, interviewed. So I was told that we're like Sasaki University. I said, oh, good, okay, I don't want to graduate, so I, I'm, I'm moving here. Uh, so we, each year we devote a certain proportion of the profit to, uh, non -pro, uh, to pro bono, low bono, and then internal research. Uh, we release research grant for our staff to compete. And I was lucky enough to win the, uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, grant. 
I don't remember how many years ago, I was in a cohort of winning that. So, um, so teams, uh, interdisciplinary teams from the staff would write a proposal and it can be any topics, it can be completely like out of you know, academic curiosity or project related or practice related. Um, so each year we found four, four uh, three or four projects, you know, it's a year long, sometimes they extend, sometimes they snowball to, to a bigger research effort at national level, including Landscape Architecture Foundation's uh, grant program. So one of them I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so for example, sea level rise um, research we, we did over 10, 12 years ago helped us secure opportunity to write uh, uh, um, uh, climate, climate ready a plan for Boston as well as a heat resiliency uh, uh, strategy for the city of Boston. So research does really help uh, pave the way for stronger practice and uh, position us um, better. So uh, one of them I mentioned uh, became a national uh, interest is decarbonization. And a lot of planners, uh, landscape architects, urban designers, you know, architects tend to uh, talk about a decarbonization, almost like you know, sustainability became a popular buzz 10, 15 years ago. But rarely people don't, uh, people are thinking of the same thing in their mind. So it becomes so abstract that um, almost there's meaningless to communicate. And the large scale, especially for open space, uh, how can we find a tool to help us um, communicate better? So instead of saying in an abstract way or um, false claim that we can achieve you no know, carbon neutrality. So uh, this diagram shows where really that impact, potential impact exists. For our you know, discipline, uh, planners, landscape architects, really is the early stage. When you uh, ideate a project or a, um, uh, a proposal, that's where the low hanging fruit and as well as the biggest potential impacts, the, the longer you wait, the later you, you do it, it becomes ad hoc, it becomes more costly. And then this is time and value. So we really emphasize um, landscape architects uh, contribute involvement when talking about uh, carbon uh, neutrality. Uh, carbon sequestration or carbon uh, um, uh, inputs. Don't wait until it's built. Don't wait until it's, it's a building. Then you're talking about operational carbon only. And all the uh, embodied carbon uh, has happened already. So this is uh, different components of uh, carbon uh, impacts or carbon footprints. For embodied carbon, that's where we landscape architects can contribute, can help uh, reduce. Because um, that's where uh, what goes into uh, field work, uh, uh, earthwork, site work, um, uh, grading, and uh, construction and material uh, as well. And then operational carbon. A lot of people talk about our, you know, uh, operational, how to use renewable energy. But if the building is built in a really uh, um, carbon intense uh, fashion, you're only uh, fixing it in an ad hoc way. And then of course, at the end of life. So that's the last component. So this is the tool that uh, came out of our internal research, uh, a small team led by Chris Hardy, who is a uh, LAF uh, fellow right now, uh, comp completed this internal research. After a year, they leveraged this one as a proposal and, um, uh, and secured LAF um, um, fellow. Uh, fellowship to so continue the, um, the research. And by the way, the tool is completely free uh, on our website. Please feel free to explore. And we found that our uh, peer firms or competitors use it even more often than we do ourselves. So it's completely free. So um, feel free to, to explore. Uh, so this is a quick example uh, how it can be applied to projects. This project is uh, uh, in Athens, uh, Kong Kong uh, Metropolitan Par uh, Park. Uh, under construction phase one right now, uh, will become the largest coastal park in Europe, uh, we're, what we're doing right now. So that's how we start, started. While we were, uh, we were doing this project, we, uh, we had the beta version of the carbon conscious tool. So that's a sketch. Uh, you can see uh, those color blocks as a uh, land cover or land cover types, you know, softscapes, hardscapes, concrete, stone pavers versus you know, long uh, woody trees. And then you can quickly uh, uh, quantify and evaluate if your sketch, if your plan as a, as a you know, big vision, um, 
uh, have any carbon uh, consequences. So probably a, a single stroke or you know, sing, uh, single color change will have a you know, big impact on uh, the carbon footprints in 30 years, in 50 years. So this, this is really the power. Remember that the diagram where you have at the beginning, at the ideation phase, at the concept phase, that's where you have the biggest potential. Your, your impact will be amplified you know, uh, through decades. Uh, and by the way, this park is huge. In, in the traditional way, there's no way you can quantify, uh, just estimate, oh, how much carbon am I going to do? So this tool is really critical. Uh, the carbon, uh, the park is bigger than uh, Central Park, New York Central Park for sure. So I, I don't remember the, the number. So this is a uh, quick video that shows how the, the eh? yeah. So you input your sketch or land cover and land use and then you specify uh, um, your, your material, land cover, um, type of uh, land uses, and it has a lot you know, further breakdown of data based on empirical research that you give a parameter to certain type of construction to certain type of material. And then you'll see why this park is a de decommissioned airport, Athens you know, uh, Airport. So we're working really hard to recycle, upcycle the existing concrete and uh, runway. And uh, um, my colleague discovered that uh, on site, the, the concrete in, in Athens, you know, they're beautiful. When you cut it open, uh, the aggregates are marble. So it's really beautiful. So um, the, the team is saving large quantity of, uh, of material for fountain, for, you know, for paving, for sculpture. So that, um, the history or, or the, um, um, the, the identity of the park is maintained in that material. At the same time, it really helps achieve um, better carbon uh, future. So uh, the goal is with this tool's help in 35 years, this park uh, will achieve carbon uh, neutral. Well, we don't know um, because, you know, again, this is not rocket science, uh, but at least this is a evidence informed recommendation or conclusion. So we're not just, you know, um, blindly claim that, you know, we will achieve carbon neutrality in 25 years, in 30 years, that you hear often people say, but uh, there's no way to, uh, to quantify. So this is the fun, fun part. Um, so sometimes when you do a large project, this is even larger. Uh, it's the foothill, uh, foothill to uh, uh, the, big, the first national park uh, in China for giant panda. And um, we don't have the expertise. We don't have the internal research capacity. Uh, you reach out, so you you know what you do not know. So we reach out to uh, Jen Guo or Jack Liu, uh, who I believe is a PhD advisor, uh, Neil Carter, who is uh, teaching at uh, CIS. Um, so we invited Jack to uh, to Sasaki. We did workshop in Boston, and, and yeah, so we all read his book, No Panda and the People. So he's a world renowned uh, mammal, especially for tiger and the giant panda expert. So with his, his help, we, um, we were really strong in this international design competition and uh, we won it. Um, so as, as I mentioned, so Southwest China, right at the foothill of the Tibetan Plateau is one of the most uh, biodiverse regions in the world. Um, and at the same time uh, in that basin, uh, as one of the uh, rapidly growing cities in China, in the world, Chengdu, city of Chengdu, right now has 20 uh, million population. Uh, it's a really interesting combination of, you know, uh, biodiversity, urban booming, and the giant pandas native habitat there. So uh, it's a weird combination, but as a designer, you have to um, respect all of them. And, uh, and believe it or not, so when we started in 2000, uh, 2018, uh, annual uh, visitors, uh, the population of vis visitors were 8 million, and they predicted uh, in, uh, by 2025, it would increase to 18 million. Right now, it's the top, one of the top five uh, destinations um, uh, for China. Um, and and I, I don't blame people. It's just so obsessing to sit there and watch uh, Panda Cups. I, I was lucky enough to, to be um, so close to over 100 Cubs. It just it's, it's hard to move away. Um, and the, the, the interesting part is that the, 
um, the ex situ conservation, which is right in the heart of the city. You can take subway there. That's the International Breeding Research Center and the publication, uh, uh, public education center. So that, that's the unique part that you're really designing for a dense, accessible, well um, active uh, urban destination, as well as the re entry of giant panda to, uh, to the wild. So we're designing three different sites, as you see. Um, those are three different, you know, uh, distinct sites, um, three different projects. You're designing for different purposes, different people, different program. Well, one of them I mentioned is in the heart of city, but there, that's where the breeding is happening. That's where all the zoos around the world uh, have their pandas from. And then uh, Panda Village, which is the, uh, it's a gateway into the city, and that's where people learn about Penn. Also, that's the training ground for national park staff. And the last one, the most rem remote one, is the uh, Dujiang Yan. So that's right at the uh, Tibetan Plateau. That's where we uh, we help train uh, panda cubs to reintroduce, reintroduce them uh, to the wild, which is still challenging right now. So panda, uh, the pop size of the population is not, I think, in the um, they, they listed the um, endangered species anymore, uh, but in the wild is still uh, um, is still challenging. So the last step is really helping um, breeding uh, um, cubs to to re-enter into the wild. That's where uh, the education came. You know, came in. You know, I had a really solid GIS uh, training uh, thanks to Shannon sitting there. I spent hours and hours in his lab. Uh, and also another uh, SNR or CS alum, uh, Andy Sell, who I recruited uh, uh, with Jones' uh, recommendation as a rock star at Sasaki as well. He was you know, a uh, core uh, team member on this project. So we did a lot of in, um, jazz analysis um, and came up with different recommendations for different sites. As, as I said, again, those are three distinct sites, uh, completely different purposes. And then another part, actually, uh, a big uh, driver of this project or aspiration is not the panda per se. Of course, panda is, is important. Panda is iconic. It's a cultural I icon, but it's umbrella species. A, a habitat is so large that it, once you uh, protect uh, the giant panda, you benefit a wide array of other species that share similar or overlapping habitat types. So that's where the impacts are. We talk you know, about uh, salamander or you know, um, a pheasant. So people may not really uh, get too excited. But when you talk about giant panda, everyone's in like, you know, yeah, I mean, no, I, I support, I fully support. So that's how important this project uh, was to us. So as an umbrella species, you can really amplify the design impact uh, for wildlife. And then, uh, so with, with, Jack, with, with Jack's help, so we understood what a uh, giant panda needs. Uh, um, so as a, as a species, they're extremely sensitive to heat. And also they need you know, uh, water uh, access. And all those um, help or guidance uh, um, really help the team to, to come up with more reliable and uh, logical analysis approach and recommendation for the habitat, whether it's for enclosure or for uh, the pre-release sites. And again, public education uh, is a very critical part of this whole effort. And we cannot tell the government, hey, you know, we're a bunch of ecologists, we're only designed for panda. So you have to uh, provide a um, holistic narrative that you benefit the, ci benefit the city. Right now it's congested. Everyone wants to go there. Uh, and then you benefit the uh, preservation um, effort. Um, so this is a diagram showing in the valley where we uh, locate uh, the educational programs or even, you know, uh, camping ground and where the protected, excluded area for, for panda. So this is a rendering. And if you look at this one, uh, it's, it's not a joke. It's a real. So staff there dress in panda suit and a spray with the panda scent, you know what, what that means, uh, to fold the hot cubs so they don't uh, rely on human beings. So it is a real uh, tactic. So the staff there um, spend time with, with the cubs to help them get familiar with the uh, more naturalized environment. 
And then, uh, of course, you know, we, we had to uh, talk to um, uh, wildlife ecologists, you know, biologists to look at the, uh, the real habitat, you know, uh, the size of the habitat, uh, what type of water sources and um, the size um, as well. So this is this shows that we're expanding um, the current um, it's, it's not enclosure. So it's a defined area for each single uh, panda. Um, um, we expand that to uh, like 25 times larger uh, in, in this park. And then uh, since day one, we wanted to reverse the um, um, the roles in this park. I mean, human, um, human beings should not be, be the owner anymore. So the wildlife um, is. So we stay on confined paths or uh, area, and they own the, re the rest in instead of the other way, the other way around. Uh, and then you can observe how staff you know, interact with the wildlife, how they train the cubs, and they, they do sunbathing every day. So at a certain time, they lay them all out on the lawn. Uh, that's where, you know, really, really fun. Uh, and the, sometimes they, they feed them apples uh, um, to just you know, to please the crowd. And then, as I mentioned, the, uh, as an umbrella species, we, we really look at other um, um, habitats, nuanced uh, habitats as well, even though with the same ecoregion. So that's another endangered species. It's kind of snob, snob nose monkey, golden monkey. They're really, really cute. Um, yeah. Okay, so. Um, so I want to transition to a, um, a campus planning um, work. Um, so, th so this is the first um, Chinese university recognized recognized by SCUP, the Society for College and University Planning, uh, um, Design Excellence Awards, uh, in 2020. Um, so this is a liberal art college in central China. Um, so how this is related to evidence based design, right? So and sometimes it's not that um, clear cut, like a science informed as. To me, it's the curiosity. So you'll find source of inspiration. Um, often, you know, um, especially for, for campus design in, in that part of the world, like a monumental um, appearance is really important. So the formal layout, symmetrical campus, you know, um, uh, it's very critical. But we came in with a different approach because the site is different. Um, we, we look at the, this is in a, in a rolling hill environment. And to us, how water flows through site uh, was the evidence, or to me, it's my inspiration. Because um, it's a new campus, uh, expansion of the existing campus, but it's a new site. There, there's very little uh, reference or inspirations or, you know, or constraints. So it's almost like a white paper. Uh, we saw the previous rounds of a design. So the client just, you know, kept trying, kept trying with multiple rounds until we tried and they said, you know, I know what I don't like, but I just couldn't articulate what I like until I saw this. Um, so we started, we, we zoom out. We always zoom out when we do a project. So we look at the uh, geography, we look at the topography, we look at, we look at the history of the land. Um, and so this is in a, in a rolling hill, rolling hill uh, area with abundant water. And then at the downstream, we have a large river and then there's a large lake. So, and then we, we build a physical model on the right, you see, uh, within the red boundary, that's the, uh, um, that's the site. I'll show the site, site of photo. Um, that was five years ago. Um, much of that central area is uh, uh, abandoned, um, rice, rice, uh, rice paddies, and some of, you know, like second growth uh, and the invasive species in the middle. And you can see the rolling hills and the subtle topography and some of the rendements of a water body. And, and to me, that's, that's beautiful. And that's way better than creating a formal entrance into a, you know, a monumental campus feeling. To me, for liberal art college needs to respect the, the roots of the, um, the land and the character of the region. So, um, so this is completely from any other like formal collegial, uh, collegial uh, pattern. So it follows uh, topography, topography, and then we explain um, you know, step by step to the client why uh, we came uh, we came came up with this this layout. So if you look at the top top left, so that's the ridge, uh, the top uh, the ridge line and the two ravines. 
and that's where you enjoy the best views, where you collect the most uh, water, and where you have um, more encounter with the wildlife, you know, small critters or insects. And to me, those are um, evidence or inspirations. And then we start to lay out where future um, buildings can be, where students uh, will uh, congregate. And then uh, we just you know layer by layer, uh, uh, we add, add, and of course you couple it with the program um, um, uh, configuration. So that's the pattern. And then you, you break it down. So within this pattern, what type of landscapes we are uh, we're maintaining, what type of landscape framework we're uh, integrating in your uh, campus. So you, you can still see that ridge line with uh, 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 with canopy trees and then large, uh, relatively large uh, uh, wood, um, wooded hills on campus, including this one is, uh, is under construction as the campus uh, arboretum. And then uh, we explain the type of landscape. So sometimes, sometimes they're uh, wooded and uh, really tranquil and that you no know, very, um, very few students would visit. And in the center, that's where you know the uh, campus activities are happening. So uh, uh, large events are happening. So that's the the quad. And then uh, the water uh, was the focus. That in the ravine, that's where you collect storm water. You treat uh, storm water as well as you provide a uh, like um, culturally um, unique uh, feature in that uh, in that area. And uh, because. When we look at the large map, so the site located in the upper uh, part of a watershed, so we know uh, water is controllable, is relatively clean, uh, and that's a resource to us. So I would rather um, daylight every single drop of water and use that as a uh, amenity. And then that landscape need to pr uh, uh, provide e ecosystem services or su support bio um, um, biodiversity. What type of habitats, from you know, ground cover to uh, understory to canopy species, from aquatic ecosystem to uh, to upland species. So this is a rendering of the entrance, uh, that ravine, um, cascading water, collecting water from the surrounding area into the first four bay, and then follows through. By the end of the um, um, this whole journey, it becomes a relatively formal water body, and that's the Gateway Lake right now, and it's done, it's constructed. And I was there two months ago, and the water was pristine, so I was more than happy. And this is the four bay. So at, at the upper uh, level, um, all water from surrounding area, from upper streams, uh, including the villages, will come into the four, four bay first, uh, settles, and then we control it and release it through the cascade all the way to um, uh, to the Gateway Lake. And the whole journey is uh, open to everyone, and that's the explanation of how water functions, travels in the site. And you'll see after it rains where it's muddy, where it's clean, where it's formal, where it's more wild. So this is a quad. Even the quad uh, reconciled that gentle topography. So there's nowhere on this campus completely flat. And we want to uh, just respect topography as a character. So this is a quad, and you see the subtle stairs, and that's where the performance uh, stage in, in the middle. So uh, all the rec fields, most of the, the rec area uh, or the running tracks are like, you know, funky and meandering throughout everywhere. And we don't need a formal, uh, of course we have one, but I would rather students to have all sorts of options and the options that they can only have experience on this campus. And then sustainability, of course, is always part of the consideration. Um, you know, water, as I said, from day one is the key driver uh, of this campus plan. And then uh, with the solar panels and the geothermal and the gray water, um, Recycle, and we start this project from planning effort, and then uh, we move on to full service. We're doing architecture and interior design for the key uh, buildings on campus, and we are also implementing the full landscape. Um, so this is the, the academic building, which is almost done right now. Uh, so we, we cut we cut it open each floor to show um, you know how buildings respond to uh, landscape. There are two uh, schools in this large building, and those two courtyards are facing opposite way. One is facing the quad, the other way is facing that four bay or lo lotus pond. So the building in itself is cr uh, 
curating different landscape experiences. At the same time, they accommodate different schools. So we're using landscape to help define uh, a space or ownership to uh, for students. So this is student center. Um, we, we've done a schematic design, but it will be in phase one, uh, phase two to be con uh, constructed. And then, so as you see, the buildings reconcile topography change uh, as well. So this was the master plan. This was a uh, winter, uh, winter shot after snow. So you see that vision really comes up. And I'm so proud that every single drop of water on campus is natural, as, as, uh, as rainwater. And there's no, they don't need to uh, supplement water. They don't need to clean it. And right now they have turtles and the fish. So this uh, last week, uh, one of the team members went there. And this is interesting too, you see that the, this campus doesn't have a formal gate. If you have been to China, almost 99% campuses or universities um, have a like large gate. Like, you know, they want that strong presence, their statement, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an intellectual, I'm, I'm a big deal. But so this one, I talked to the client that um, sometimes, you know, uh, a fence or a gate is to pretend people who uh, a sniper to 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 protect uh, to to prevent people from entering only if they follow. So if people really want to break the rules, whether it's a fence or it's a gate, nobody's going to follow that. So I would rather keep the campus as open as possible. And this stone stone wall is at a, a waist level. So you have the psychological edge well defined, but the visual uh, connectivity so throughout the entire campus. And if someone want to climb over the fence, it's like 10 feet, they can do it. It's, you know, uh, you know um, three feet, they can do it. Uh, people respect that, even if it's just a curb, they won't step. Um, okay, I have 10 minutes to talk about uh, design integrated designs. And I have a few examples. One is the Jading Central Park uh, post-occupancy evaluation. And the other one is uh, Hideo Sasaki Foundation's research. It's a Charles River uh, floating wetland. And then um, uh, SNRE Masters project that we sponsored um, four or five years ago uh, with Chicago River Walk um, as post-occupancy study. So Jetting Park, this was the first project in 2008 I participated in at Sasaki. So I was really lucky uh, to join this large, you know, uh, large team. Uh, and this won 2020 ASLE National uh, Award. And so this is a bird's eye view. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly uh, because the point is not the design, is how design can generate uh, opportunity for research or uh, you know, um, create a new knowledge. And this is the design intention. We created woodlands and tree groves uh, from near zero on the site to 12 hectares. So we could quantify uh, the amount of uh, uh, trees or green covers um, um, uh, we would propose, but we, in, you know, in the next few slides, I'll show you. The, um, the bigger question is that how do they f perform? Uh, do they perform as we proposed or hypothesized? And can we claim you know, the, all the benefits? And you hear that all the time, like you know, this ecological design, ecological park, but what does that mean? And then wetland. So we created a six hectares or 15 acres of wetland. And again, this is in Shanghai. All the canals are remnants of the, uh, the historical landscape. So it's, it's hard to define whether it's natural or it's, uh, it's artificial. So that entire landscape, the long story short. So uh, part of that linear park, uh, or the entire linear park is threaded together by that, that canal. So this is, uh, I think this is, 2010, um, a shot you know, from the adjacent building. So the park was recently, uh, was newly completed. You see the trees are small at that time. So we planted 20, uh, 21,600 native um, woody trees, uh, 94 species, 100% native to the lower Yangtze River Delta. And then a, a quick, you know, before and after shots. So this was the site of visit in 2007. And you see the direct, you know, industrial runoff into the canal and the uh, channelized edges. And of course, there's no nothing along the edge, whether it's bi biology or even you know, uh, human activities. There's no, there's no reason for people to visit. And this is after, so just within a year. And the, uh, the mayor was our um, 
uh, client. And the mayor was really visionary. So at that time, this district um, um, was fairly new, and the mayor saw the value of an ecological park as a catalyst to a healthy city. Instead of doing the build uh, environment first, and they insert a leftover park. So he, he, you know, he has architecture and planning uh, PhD. So he commit, uh, commissioned Sasaki to lead uh, uh, design for this park. And that really acted as the catalyst for this new district. So around the park, you see this uh, civic center, the public library, the, the courthouse, and that really became the, uh, the, um, the nucleus of the, the district. And then, of course, benefited from the public transit. So the light rail stopped uh, right in the, in the middle of the park. So you see that's the progress that was in the construction. During construction, of course, we remove all the hard edges. Uh, and then, um, uh, like well and plants just you know, came over, took over because the, the water, again, water was well connected through the entire city. So it's, uh, it's pretty dirty and uh, you know, full of nutrients. Of course, well and loved that, some invasive as well. And the mighty is native there, by the way. Uh, so they took over. You know, we had to cut and burn. So, um, and I, I showed the park to some of my friends. They said, uh, you need a more design, you know, work. This feels like so wild. I said, well, that's the best compliment. Yeah. And, and we preserved some of the older ginkgo trees as well. That's one, uh, uh, one of the field that, that are over 100 years old. And, and no matter how we regraded uh, around the edge of the canals, we protected those trees. And then egret, it's not a precious species, but after the park was implemented, they came back. And before that, hard edges, there was no fish, and they, they wouldn't come back. And then lotus. Um, so visually, you see that, right? So the park works, but can we claim that it's an ecological park? Can we, uh, uh, um, yeah, C can we can we claim that credit? So we work with the uh, East China Normal University uh, Regional Eco Ecology Lab, and and so and it became an opportunity for uh, two graduate students' thesis work. So it was a year and a half. And uh, um, so they, f they followed, followed up. So you see on the top, that was an illustrative plan and I was a part of. And drafting it was, was fun. And then on the bottom, that's uh, uh, Google, Google Earth Photo. So you see that was exactly implemented as we designed. And so that's a great opportunity for research. When do you have a de uh, design experiment at that scale, at in that urban environment with human behavior, with human activities in it, for you to test how it works, right? We think, um, we, we treat that as a as science experiment. So we presented that opportunity and then the graduate students and the faculty advisor helped identify those four sites. So uh, four sampling sites for water samples, one, two, three. Generally it's from one, two, three. That, water flow. And the number four is really interesting. Four is a uh, separated channel. If you look at uh, the plan originally, of course, you know, against assumption for water health, connectivity, flow is always key. You never break it, you never um, block it. But um, throughout um, the process, we figured, you know, because the water is not that controllable within our site, it comes from you know, miles and miles of urban environment. Why don't we cut this off? as experiment control. You know, when you do experiment, you control uh, one environment that you have a full um, uh, controlled environment. So it, you see, the plan was not implemented uh, as we intentionally uh, intended. So number four became a separate water body uh, or relatively separate, you know, unless, you know, there's a flooding. So that's really interesting. So you measure one, two, three, see how the park works to affect water quality. I'm not showing improving effect from one to uh, four, three when water flows through this um, naturalized um, canal. And then number four is completely separate. It's rainwater, maybe it's you know, uh, sea page water, just see the quality. And then, yeah. So the graduate student came, came out every month and collecting water sample, air sample, uh, you know, noise, you know, temperature. Uh, we, we did a lot of film, COD, BOD, uh, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, you know, clarity, chlorophyll, you name it. Everything to collect samples and they came back to, um, to the lab to analyze. And then we mapped them out quickly. You see from one to four, uh, I, I, I can't say it's like 
percent and no confidence that it's scientific, but it, no, that pattern is hard to ignore. That from one to three, uh, in general, there's sort of an improvement, right? For BODs, you no know, nitrogen, phosphorus, BOD, COD, they all sort of from one upper stream to lower stream after water flows through the park. There's signs of improvements. And we all saw that with naked eyes, but this is data to prove that. And number four, that the cutoff, that control, performs way better than everything else. So that, to me, the, uh, uh, shows that the park as a um, ecological or eco ecosystem services works. When you can control the input and control pollutants from upper stream, um, just the park itself can create a better water uh, uh, environment or aquatic ecosystem. And then these are the dry data, so I'm not going to go through. Um, so if you compare one to three, of course, four is not a part of the comparison. Uh, the best uh, perform performance in the winter that we can remove up to 96% of uh, COD and 90% of a BOD and um, uh, nitrogen, let me see. oh, see here. So 66% uh, of ni um, nitrogen So in the winter when site three compared to site one. Of course, four is always better because four doesn't have in uh, input, urban input. So yeah, so that's, um, a research that we um, discovered after completing that project. And of course, you know, the science community was waiting for or looking for an opportunity like that as well, instead of you know, designing something artificial for the students. And that was really fun and meaningful uh, for students to participate in uh, real time action from design to implementation uh, in a park. And then um, next one is fun. Um, is, Charles River Floating Wetland. So this is the uh, Sasaki Foundation. So this is not a professional work. This is a foundation research project. So Sasaki uh, Foundation um, sponsors a local community, uh, community-driven research projects. So this is one of them. And I was uh, part of the team. Uh, we don't provide design, so we only support them. So the, uh, we, we call them, uh, the power of the design belongs to everyone, the community members drive the, the need and the desire and we facilitate it. We organize charrettes in the office. We have a volunteer time for staff uh, to sit down, sketch, listen to their uh, needs and desire and help them facilitate um, uh, a design solution. So this is a collaboration with the Charles River Conservancy, uh, Northeastern University and a bunch of other organizations. So this was the board. Um, we we'll look at the history of uh, Charles River in Boston, in Cambridge. You know, it used to be heavily polluted, but now every summer uh, the city hosts uh, like a swimming in the Charles event. And but still, uh, it's not perfect, and uh, um, uh, the community wants to see how we can improve it. Probably not to just you know completely uh, using this as a tactic to um, uh, to improve water, water quality, but uh, more so um, than like as a public education. Like demonstration or showcase what a floating wetland is, what what it does, and then you uh, collect um, data. And this is a diagram showing what uh, floating wetland will look like um, on Charles River and how you anchor that. And th there are a lot of technical um, things that you wouldn't uh, realize once you start sitting down with the community members and what the materials when they break down. Uh, in Cambridge, it's so cold in the winter. Um, what you do? And then we start to sketch uh, how do you form, because it's modulized, you can construct such a uh, floating wetland in one piece. And we're sketching almost like, you know, just you know, um, a tantric, um, um, like a game to just to, to create a physical model. And of course, at the same time, we provide planning design for, uh, for the team. Um, so this was the, uh, the launching day. And, uh, you know, I was, I think it was uh, coconut fiber, uh, biodegradable. Um, and then this is, yeah, this is uh, when it was ready, uh, and also for, for planting installation. And you see that window cut out in the middle. That's my humble contribu contribution. So I thought, oh, uh, along the edges, when you collect samples, you know, you, it's just so open to the open water that it, um, you can't control. Well, why don't you create a window? At least relatively, that's a more of a confined area. So, um, so um, it was uh, hauled by a boat into the middle, um, into the uh, uh, middle of the Charles River, and when I go to work every day on Charles Charles River, you know the the subway goes on the bridge. I see this every day. It's just um, it's just such a good feeling in the morning. 
And in 2020, 20 or 2020, 2020, uh, uh, Max, Max is the PhD student, um, civil engineering PhD student at the Northeastern who um, was the, the leader of this research. And he was probably the happiest person where everyone else was locked at home. You know, he was kayaking you know, to, in the middle of the river, around the wetland, collecting samples, looking at the plants. So that, that was him. And uh, yeah, on a kayak, collecting water. And then he would go back, also, also monitor the root development. And then go back to the lab to count you know, zooplankton, phytoplankton as an indicator of the health uh, of the uh, water, as well as um, impacts of the floating wetland. Yeah, so this um, uh, zooming photo of the, of, uh, the zooplankton, phytoplankton. And then now it's become so popular, you know, people, people like that as a feature on the Charles River. And when people kayak, they would come closer, circle around, look at the signage, see what this is. Uh, so I think it's a great piece for public education awareness. And it, it can flow, you know, you can, you can hold it this way, call it that way, you know. Um, I would sponsor, you know, uh, activities like you know you charge a fee like you if you want to showcase my well and you know you, you pay for it and in the winter of course of course you know as stored uh, uh, in the storage this is not a uh, on a um, on ice um, so I'm going to skip the next one really quickly because you no know, uh, it's not about a design most of it, most of you know of Ch Chicago Riverwalks really successful ur urban design landscape architecture done by uh, by us by Sasaki and uh, no from no from this on the left uh, to this extremely popular in the summer and we have a floating wetland as well and then um, showing the water level and uh, activating water edges for water sports, you know, for fishing uh, activities. And then um, we uh, sub submitted a master's project proposal uh, at that time uh, called SNRE. And then, um, yeah, students were excited and I attended that affair as well. I remember so student was, uh, was asking, yeah, uh, how does it like to work with a design firm uh, as a client? And uh, so, yeah, it, it went well, and I came back uh, a year and a half later, uh, attended their final presentation. It was really, really well done. And um, uh, Landscape Architecture Foundation's, um, uh, it's called a CSI program, did Chicago River work as well, and decided, you know, SNRE's uh, findings a lot. So I think they deserve a lot of credit. Uh, so really well done. Again, so that's another quick example of how design practice uh, could and can benefit, uh, could, could generate opportunities for research and it can uh, create that mutually beneficial um, relationship with, uh, with science, with the research uh, um, community. So, um, yeah, so students came, uh, went out to collect uh, sediment um, uh, samples and then uh, analyze back you know, in the lab uh, uh, at UFM and then I'm not going to talk about the uh, the conclusion, but yeah, so that that's about about it. My talk an hour. So. Thank you. Many many thanks, Cho. Uh, let's yeah. make some time for questions. We we'll take ten minutes. Um, there's so much here. Many questions I would like to ask, but let's see what folks. Uh, in the audience might want to talk about. Please raise your hand and and uh, we'll get the, there, there's a hand over there. Get the mic. Uh, here's one. Um, thank you for the lecture. I'm I'm very interested in the campus design like case, and I'm interested in like after you design the campus, like what do you do to? I think like like for later management, will you like communicate with the um, with the with the school to like how they should do the management for the campus. For example, uh, I think you mentioned about like to build some ecology uh, friendly like environment for those. Um, like wild wildlife to uh, wild animals to live on the campus. I think f um, for my undergraduate university, we we met a problem like there are a lot of native snakes, and so students are worrying about that. So the camp like the university just build some net along those natural like grassland and to set and to keep students from going into the grassland. Also keeps the snakes from 
getting out of their field. So I'm like, I'm, I'm like interested in like how you want you, you may deal with such a situation. And the, it's like, how do you define the boundary kind of between like students activity and those, those like animals and how, and it's related, I think also to like when we design something and related to later management, how we keep the, things going on the way we designed to do. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as, as I mentioned, so we, um, it's, a, it's a holistic um, l landscape framework or ecology framework. We define areas that are discouraging students from entering. So those are more enclosed woods. Of course, you know, pu public safety is another issue, but uh, it's intentional. Certain areas more open, more clear, you know, manicured landscape, that's needed, that's fine. Uh, for more students to occupy at night, well lit, and in some areas wooded, as dense as it is. Luckily, we don't. I don't think we have much uh, many snake species there. If they do, I would uh, encourage students to visit uh, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my answer. Can, can I amplify her question a yeah. little? Because I'd I'd love to hear you talk, Tao, about how uh, Suzaki is building in. Uh, management in the future into the way you interact with clients about projects now. Yeah, uh, of course, any designers uh, would desire to follow up their projects, you know, f through the entire uh, life cycle. Uh, but the reality is um, that's rare. Um, first, you know, the client doesn't have the budget for you to to follow to follow all the time. And for for this XYU or Xi'an University, uh, we're lucky that we we build a really really strong relationship with the client and how. Um, how to educate them to manage the campus is a very important part of this campus plan because this campus plan will take decades to implement to uh, entire phase and the client has recognized the value of well informed you know management strategies instead of just you know mow the lawn, uh, you know, pump you know uh, storm water so they they see the benefit and it really it really depends um, and um, communication is the key. So I mean, the reality is the budget, you know, sometimes uh, the university uh, or certain clients, uh, they don't have the budget. They never uh, envision that you, know, you would need that much attention to maintain a healthy, uh, popular uh, landscape. Um, and sometimes, you know, their team um, uh, turnover, right? You you well educated. You build a strong relationship, and the person, the key person, left, and the entire team left. And then the, another team comes in. You no, know, they operate based on their own experience. They see a medal, like, oh, this is messy. Uh, I need to do my job well. Next morning, it's all gone. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us today. Um, I was curious when you were talking about the Panda Reserve, three different sites with three different, very different applications. Where do you find yourself need, needing to be the most flexible while adhering to a coherent vision? Uh, can you articulate the, the, the second part? Was where do I see myself in? Um, yeah, that's a that's an abstract question. Uh, I think a design language, right? I mean, pe when people experience three different sites, they can feel that that it, or they see um, hint or elements that are consistent or they're related. Uh, but can I tell the truth? Uh, it's a design competition, and then it's huge, right? And we won it. And then three sites were uh, given to three different teams, unfortunately. So three international firms were asked to implement three different sites. So in reality, that will be a hard uh, challenge to maintain the coherent vision across three. So that's the reality. Thank you very much. The uh, hottest question in Ann Arbor, at least since 2009, has been how is the center of the city to be developed? As a high-rise money-making proposition, 
for taxes or as a place for people and for the pandas to play and carbon sequestration and so on. And there's been the plan for a community commons and a civic center building developed out of the people's initiative, though the powers that be are most committed to the money-making view of the uh, priorities of the city. And you put forward a view of how academic, intellectual, scientific uh, planning process can be persuasive in putting forward a vision that can actually be persuasive to the powers that be. That's what we need in Ann Arbor. We need a center of the city community commons, a civic center building, a place for people to gather it's connected to the library. Ever since the civic center, the old courthouse was destroyed in the mid-1950s, there's been no central park in Ann Arbor. People voted for it, but you and you put together a view of how to research and, and uh, develop a plan, and that's what we need in Ann Arbor for the development of this particular town and how the university might be a, uh, a an ally in this. So far, the uh, the, the uh, Center for uh, uh, Sustainability has not really connected to the community, though we hear there is that interest. How do you suggest we might proceed for our own community commons and civic center building in place for our pandas to play? I, I, I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, um, I mean, I, for sure, you know, I definitely um, would advocate for a stronger relationship between the university and the city and the community, right? It sh it, they should be complementary. And our task right now, my involvement is within the uh, UFM campus property. But we uh, we had open houses last week, and we welcome you know, um, well, community members to, to join as well. Right now, uh, by 8 p.m., I think there's still open house at Pierpont uh, Common. I think, you know, at this stage, we are really, at least as designers, we're open to all feedback, all suggestions. And then again, as since you know, at the beginning of this talk, uh, designers face um, like conflicting demands all the time. It's the art of a trade-off. Find the best solution um, that you can. I mean, all all needs, all asks are legit, and we you know we're, we're just humbling listening at this stage. Yeah. Is there one more question? One more. Uh, you started off with the answers blowing in the wind, but I didn't see any wind turbines in that uh, campus setting. <laughs> Is there a reason you don't consider wind? Oh, no, it's just um, that uh, that was us. So when I was in school, when Oliver and I were in the same class, that was just a part of it. Because, you know, I said, uh, whenever I think of UFM, when I think of, you know, the campus, uh, the fun and the people are uh, what come to my mind the first. So I... That was just to help me re relax a little bit. No, I, I was so nervous to present to you guys uh, because you know me and I know you um, and I don't want to be judged. So, so yeah, that was just purely for fun. And it's, um, yeah, just 20 years uh, ago and that was how much love we had for each other and how much love I had for this campus. Well, let's finish by showing how much we appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Thank you.